after the convention was uh, 117, legalization of marijuana. Right. Um, are we ready as a nation to have an adult conversation about that issue yet? I think so. I mean, you know, if you look at public opinion on it, most Canadians are on side with that. The data between legalization, criminalization, somebody who is that they're comfortable with needs to explain that to people. That there, it doesn't mean just you know kind of throwing open the doors and you can do whatever you want and blah blah blah. And the second thing is figuring out a strategy how to deal with uh, the Harper guys because they're obviously against any and all of the insight marijuana and so on. So there's an opportunity there politically, latter, you know, on the latter point. Um, but you need somebody who's going to kind of lead that charge. Um, you touched on almost, there's, there seems to be a communications war that's being lost right now uh, by anyone that isn't conservative. Mm -hmm. I, I've been trying to reach our audience uh, with the balancing or the contrasting of minimum sentences. Um, the six pot plants equals six months in prison. Yeah, yeah. The unwanted sexual advances of a minor, 45 day minimum sentence. Mm -hmm. I mean, is, is that just too tough of a message for liberals, or is it something that should be front and center so that Canadians no, can look at that so. contract? What happened last night? McGinty spoke. Um, what was his first standing up? Do you remember what happened last night? I, I actually was, I was cutting footage. Okay, well, you should take a look at her, see if you can get the footage of that. The first thing he said is, we should be building schools instead of jails. And it went, like, the place went nuts. So, like, you know, 2,500 people are on their feet, clapping their hands and, and cheering and stuff. So that told me that there is a constituency for that point. We're not the party of um, you know get tough on naughty you know 14 year olds kind of thing. That's them. That's their thing. We're never going to get it. So we need to carve out what makes sense for us. This is particularly the case of Quebec, right? If we're going to come back, they will be in the province of Quebec because the NDP elect obviously elected people who are you know are not going to get reelected. And if there's any place in the country where sensitivity about law and order, so-called law and order issues, exists, it's Quebec. So, like, it's low-hanging fruit, this, politically, but who's the champion of it? I don't know. So how do you then balance, like, civility and politics, which Canadians would want to see, especially when they watch things like Question Period? How do you balance that with also, you know, basically slaying someone for, for policies that seem to be out of touch with the Canadian people? How do you sort of balance those two? Like, what do you mean? Like, in terms of, uh, you know, people getting kind of reacted against for policy pieces? Yeah, is it a tough tight, uh, is it a tough rope to, to, to walk across where you, you want to be civil, you want to make politics something that isn't a blood sport, but oh, at the I same see. time, you really want to hammer them for their policies that seem to be out of touch? At, I mean, you know, the start of every parliamentary session, it's not a decor, I'm a rock and a tree each other respect, and it's like you can set your watch by when it falls apart, because it never lasts. And I'm comfortable with that. Like I, I like to see passion and a bit of conflict in on these important issues. These are issues that affect our lives, and I like to see them kind of duking out. Obviously, you know when they're swearing at each other and stuff like that, it's not good. But you know my style is I kind of I'm not subtle, so uh, <laughs> you know I don't mind it when people are not subtle. Um, but obviously Canadians have said you know there's a we're prepared to accept passion, but we don't want it to start degenerating into, you know, schoolyard insults. So has the, achieving a balance there. Has the Ron Paul candidacy kind of ex, uh, exposed um, common places between left and right that they can they don't necessarily have to always be fighting each other? That it can be, uh, uh, for example, foreign policy, uh, you know, drug laws, things like that. The left and the right seem to agree on a lot of things, especially the libertarian side of the conservatives. Paul's uh, candidacy is important. I mean, he's got the, you know, the kind of the loony right constituency in the states, which has always been in and around 10, 15 percent. He's got them. What's also been interesting, obviously, to your question is, like, the young people he's got. Why is that? And it's, um, I think, it's not just because he's libertarian. He's the anti-politician. Like, the Yale studies show, they're the only ones who've really done, why is it that young people don't vote? And what they found is that all the stuff we center, see around us here, like the emblems of political life, you know, membership and cards and all that, young people don't like it. That's what turns them off of politics. So when somebody comes along who's outside of that, like Paul was, or to extent how Obama was in 2008, 
right, the impossibility of a black man becoming president of the United States, young people are attracted to that. So anything that's traditional and establishment turns them off. They don't want to, they're not into that. So that's why I think Paul appeals to them. But you know, there's stuff in his past that is avowedly racist and anti-Semitic, and it's appalling. And I think when young people come to consider that, they'll reject it. Don't you think that maybe they, they just think that uh, it was a lack of oversight for him? Like, it, it was a really hard thing to believe that he would write those anti-Semitic and racist things. It just d doesn't vibe with But he him. did. Well, some of them he didn't write. Um, but, you know, the, the disgusting things said about uh, Dr. King and blacks and the intelligence of blacks in the United States and, you know, Jews, you know, were possibly involved in 9-11 and all that crazy shit, because that's what it is, crazy shit. Um, he did not write all of it, but he facilitated its publication, and then he didn't repudiate it until he became, you know, a big wheel in the Republican Party and Tea Party movement, and that's when he started saying, I'm against this stuff, and that's not, that's not how it works. Like, you got to be responsible at every step of the way, not when it's just somebody's pointing a microphone into it. Well, and you touched on earlier how conflict, uh, you enjoy conflict. I also enjoy conflict. Do you remember our conflict? No. Um, I, I questioned the validity of the Rocco Rossi story about him pining before the election that he was going to become leader. I'm James DeFiori. And you told me you were going to take my house. I did? Was it a nice yeah, house? You, I'm a renter. Maybe I'm going to take it. <laughs> I'm a renter, though. No, what was the... Um, what did you say? You posted on ben Benedict Baldi and how he, uh, a week before the election, he uh, had a meeting at his campaign headquarters um, criticizing Hudak and that he um, hinted that he would like to be leader. And I said, oh, no, no, I, I asked don't. you for your sources. Yeah, well, I can't. I can tell you it was in the Jewish community. Um, and it was, my sources were uh, rabbinical scholars, let's put it that way, who were present at that meeting. And he said um, that he wanted to be leader of the Progressive Conservative Party of Ontario. And so that meeting took place on a Sunday evening after they had a secret phone call, which I also listened to, because uh, we got the codes. And J Jason Kenney was on that call, Rocco Rossi. A number of candidates, or six or seven PC candidates, right after that. And it was all about Israel, and liberals are anti-Semites, and we're not, and stuff like that. So that was pretty appalling. So we were focused on that, and then I got calls later that night from people who were at a subsequent meeting who would also participate in the phone call, um, who uh, said, this is what Rocco said. And so, I know he said it. And it's consistent with what he said to me personally before he became a PC. Why so wasn't it a bigger enough. story? Why wasn't it, that would have been front page news if it was... Because that was the same week of the um, home forward pamphlet. Right, so... You covered that extensively as well. Yeah, and uh, the homophobic pamphlet was kind of out. Like, we had a copy of it, as opposed to the, um, if I'd come out and said we were, we heard the phone call, then you get all their, you know, sp spying on us and all that crap, so, but uh, I did listen to the phone call, I had a tape recording the phone call, and they were calling the Liberal Party anti-Semitic. And then the pamphlet stuff, the homophobic pamphlet stuff, started that same weekend. They were distributing it in Brampton, and one of our kids went in and just picked it up and walked in. Can you do me a favor and yeah. just tell our audience that you're not going to, in fact, sue I'm me? I'm not going to sue him. I love him now, <laughs> and I'm just a little emotional, but so is he. So I am. You should watch so. his show. Well, you know what the good. funny part is? I'm an MC, a hip-hop artist, and this guy's a punk musician. Yeah, so, it's hard to believe. Yeah, we come from the same borough in New York. I don't know if you knew that. No. Hip-hop hip -hop and punk were born out of the same time and Queens. shared clubs. Yeah, yeah, they actually shared nightclubs, and they split costs and everything. They got along. Yeah. Well, I'm a big uh, Grandmaster Flash and all that. I mean, we were listening to that. Hey in the uh, early days, but I don't like what hip-hop has become, you know, the celebration of misogyny. I'll send you some underground stuff. You'll like yeah, it again, like I promise. Warren, right. thank you so Thanks, much. Man. Appreciate right. it. Great.